Separate discussion over here. <laughs> Another meetup, right? As long as you're buying beer, I'll tell you the whole story. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, thanks. Before I started, uh, so Mike uh, introduced uh, Kevin Alexis, me. Uh, also, thanks for Dean for valuable contribution. Uh, if you will find the best reason to enter, it was Dean. And uh, thanks, Mike, uh, for uh, doing a great job in reviewing the book. Uh, so uh, we will uh, talk about three different topics. Uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about my reviews and uh, do a gentle introduction. Uh, Alan is going to talk about new features of Uzi that he discovered after writing the book. It's usually you write the book and then you think, oh crap, there is a lot of other things that they couldn't find. So that is going to be Alex's topic. And Kevin will talk uh, about security, which is one of the most important uh, topics in the book. So uh, my previous uh, introduction. Uh, you have to do things by the book, right? We have to do this. Uh, so, uh, what is uh, MapReduce? Uh, so, MapReduce is uh, a framework for highly parallel execution on the uh, vast uh, majority of data. Uh, it's uh, based on uh, Map and Reduce uh, from uh, Lisp and other functional languages, but uh, in uh, Hadoop, uh, the uh, combinators uh, from uh, functional languages were modified a little bit to work on the data that is stored on the hard drive rather than on the data that is in memory like it is done with Lisp. And um, it's uh, based on uh, divide and conquer, uh, so the data is split into multiple chunks and uh, those chunks can be processed individually. So in a nutshell, what is happening in my previous, the programming model is very simple. You have a bunch of key value pairs that is running through the mapper, and mapper converts them to another key value pairs, and then a shuffle and sort comes into play and convert them into yet another pair of key value pairs which are delivered to a user and reduce and convert them into yet another key value pairs. So it's a very simple model and uh, it's very simple to implement. Uh, the problem typically in this, in this are the elements of the actual execution. So what is happening is uh, the data is split into chunks, which are input splits. And uh, the input format is uh, controlling how to split the data. So by stop pointing this thing at me. <laughs> <laughs> you make me nervous. Can I go to the other side? <laughs> <laughs> I'm camera shy. <laughs> so uh, input format uh, controls how to split the data, and basically, all writing input split, you can achieve different splits of data. So there are two different operations. One operation is how to split the data. The second operation is how to read the data. So you can use, uh, depending on the format in which data is, you can implement your own reader if you can read the data in any format that you want. Uh, the input format is defined in the driver. Uh, so uh, once the data is read, it uh, gets to the mapper in a form of value pairs, so the mapper does its magic, converts it to another key value pairs, and uh, spits it out to the temporary storage. Then the Hadoop framework is uh, doing shuffle and sort, so it makes sure that <coughs> the values for the same key are collected together.
here that if uh, these pieces are formed to the reducer. The reducer does its own magic here in uh, outputs the data. This is a very similar architecture, similar to the input format that controls how the data is split, the output format controls how the output data is uh, stored. And uh, the uh, record writer defines the actual format that is used to write the data. Yeah. Would this all be happening on the uh, slave node or cash, cash node? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, let's try to agree when we're not bringing PR into picture, but so we can cut this one for now. Uh, because in PR, basically, the same thing is happening. Uh, but it is happening for the slave node. So the driver itself is using the run uh, outside of the cluster, and it submits uh, everything to the cluster itself. So the, the stuff in blue is kind of like HDFS side of things? Uh, no, it's not HDFS side of the fence. Uh, HDFS is running on every slave node. I mean, if we go into the mechanics of this, um, every slave node is running two demons. It's running HDFS demon and uh, it's running a job tracker demon. And uh, job tracker demon is responsible for the majority of operations here. HDFS daemon is responsible for accessing the data on HDFS because it goes to the name node, it finds where the data is, it does all this management of the powers. Uh, the blue thing is something that you write, and of course you write the mapper and producer itself. The rest is part of the framework that is doing a lot of work for you. I mean, one of the advantages of uh, Hadoop's implementation of MapReduce, you are writing only a very limited amount of code, and a lot of work is done for you by the framework itself. So it provides a clean separation between what application developer is doing and what infrastructure is implementing under the covers as part of the framework. Uh, so uh, the framework uh, provides three main features. It provides scheduling. So when you submit the job, it uh, split the job into pieces that are executed by individual mappers, and it submit these subtasks to the individual map, uh, mappers. That's uh, scheduling piece. Synchronization, uh, my previous framework is responsible to make sure that all the mappers are completed and data is moved to reducer before reducers actually start. And uh, then it is doing a lot of error and fault handling. Keep going. Tell you stop moving. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't catch me. Empty me all for you. <laughs> So uh, this slide basically shows the major components of the MapReduce framework and uh, how things are working together. Uh, but, I mean, MapReduce uh, framework is uh, simple enough and uh, it's very easy to use. The bigger problem is how do you take a real life problem and convert it to the uh, MapReduce job. And this was one of the main motivation for writing the book because uh, there is uh, a Hadoop Bible that describes all the APIs and some of the things that are happening internally, not well enough, but to some extent. But there are very few publications that actually walk you through the real problem and explain to you how to convert this problem to the map reduce. And uh, in this presentation, uh, we will look at uh, some examples. So we will look how to build map reduce jobs for parallel processing. Uh, we will uh, look at uh, simple data processing. Uh, we will uh, look at building joins. Uh, and we will look at some specific 
uh, joint examples. Um, we were trying to make sure that we are not using the cow example because after reading all her two books, uh, the first impression that I had, you can count words and pretty much that's it. You can't do anything else. <laughs> Uh, so uh, here is the first uh, made-up example, uh, which uh, doesn't seem like my previous example, but in reality it is. I mean, anything that is uh, adhered to the rule of comparison, the parallel process, fine, stop it. All right. Uh, can be converted to the my previous example. And here is the simple face recognition example. Uh, let's assume that we have the algorithm for the face recognition and we need to run it through the millions of pictures. How do we do this? So Hadoop provides a very simple way of doing it. It's a simple mapper on the job. Uh, your input format is going to split the images between as many mappers as you can start. And then every mapper will read the image does face recognition and spits out the result. Very simple, and uh, we have a lot of implementations here in IKEA that are following exactly this desired approach. I mean, a lot of things, were, for example, uh, the things that Alberto is doing right for life and is built on this principle. Uh, Another very common uh, problem is uh, building joints on the data sets. And uh, when you are trying to solve this problem in my reviews, uh, there are several uh, approaches to this. Uh, the generic approach that is described everywhere is uh, reduce surface joint. So the idea is very simple. Uh, you take uh, as many data files as you want. Uh, you read them one by one, and uh, you output every record based on the key that you want to join on. Then the reducer, the, uh, the uh, shuffle consumer does it magic, and it guarantees you that <coughs> all the values for the given key will come together to the reducer, and then the reducer just combines the results. Very simple and very straightforward, uh, very slow. Generically, it's very slow. Uh, so uh, there is uh, another uh, special case that we will talk about of the reducer side joint, which is called packaging. So uh, the difference is you don't have a predefined key, you just uh, deal with proximity. And I'll show the example of how we deal with that. And uh, then uh, there is uh, the third approach, which is approach uh, based on uh, baby joints. So if one of your data sets is small enough to break it in memory, you can break it in memory in the mapper and uh, start reading uh, through the second data set and do a joint on the fly. Um, so uh, let's start uh, from the simple example of uh, inverted uh, indices. Uh, everybody who ever tried to do search should be familiar with what inverted indices are. Um, do, do I have to go into details? clear enough. So if you have uh, this, uh, then uh, it's uh, very, very easy. Uh, you take, uh, I mean, it basically describes it, and uh, this is how the job goes. So you have the mapper that is, for example, reading every line of the document and uh, spits out the record for every uh, word. And uh, then uh, shuffle and sort brings the same words together and the reducer is just a simple identity reducer and you have your word in this. Very Now here is uh, another example that doesn't seem 
be admitted to your exam. Uh, doesn't seem very uh, my previous year. Um, I work for Nike, which is uh, the the division of Nike that I we work for is uh, my big company. So there is a lot of many problems that we have to solve, and this is one uh, of the real uh, problems that we solve that is doing right now. And Mindy, who is not in there, is the one who actually came up with the algorithm. So uh, you have uh, the road in uh, in a two-dimensional map. Uh, the road is just a central line, just one line. Uh, in reality, as we all know, the roads have to be, otherwise we don't drive from them. So how do you convert the central line representation to the one road? Uh, so uh, the approach is very simple. If you know how many lanes the road has, and you know the width of the lane, which in the United States is standard, you can calculate the width of the road. The problem with this is uh, when you do this, uh, your intersections that used to be just points now have shapes. So uh, this is uh, how you convert this uh, job into my previous. Every road is showing up at two nodes, you have to merge them together. Uh, here is uh, another real example, which is also an implementation that is running here in India. Uh, we need to elevate the road. Uh, it's nice in Chicago because everything is flat in California. Everything goes like this. So we have two data sets. One uh, data set is uh, links. The other data set is the actual elevation. So for every point <coughs> of the earth, we know how high this point is. And this is uh, the example of by uh, uh phase two. So the idea here is because the elevation is uh, defined on the squares. Uh, the easiest thing to do is first to split all the links by the squares, and then uh, for every square, bring in memory the elevation values and the link values, and elevate. Again, uh, this is how this can be done in uh, my previous. So you read uh, through all the links, all the links that belong to the same square, you have the same key, so you plug it up together by geographic proximity. And uh, you start elevating them. Uh, the problem with this is a given link can belong to more than one square, so that uh, at the end you have to merge the links. Uh, that's another Dimitri's problem. Uh, when uh, you are trying to go with the links, uh, there is a uh, frustrating problem for quite a lot of things. Uh, in 2D maps, uh, links are uh, connect to each other just because some of the attributes are changing. So there is a lot of links that together compose a strand, and uh, we need something to get rid of these multiple links and bring them all together. And uh, here, the approach was uh, quite uh, interesting. So you go through every node, 
and uh, you are looking how many links this node connects. If it connects only two links, it's by valid node, and you can remove it and build the link that crosses. Uh, if it is, uh, if it has uh, more than two, it's a real split, and you keep only a very small node. So this is what the first map reduce job does, and the second map reduce job is, and consequent map reduce jobs, they are <coughs> looking at partial strands and look if they combine them together. Uh, the interesting thing, we've never found the mathematical proof that the process converges, but the damn thing converges very fast. And again, uh, this is the description of the first job. And uh, this is the description of the second job. Uh, so these examples uh, kind of show you that uh, you can take a lot of problems and easily convert them into my previous job. You have to just start thinking in terms of keys and values, and you have to kind of reformulate your problem into these terms. Uh, this was uh, very interesting to me. Uh, there is a excellent book which is called uh, MapReduce for uh, Text Processing, which is written by Jimmy Dean, which is, in my mind, one of the best books that explains what MapReduce really is, but uh, I'm not referring to this book, I'm referring to the article that Jimmy wrote about a year ago after spending a year in Twitter. He wrote an interesting article which is called If you have a hammer, make sure that all your problems are nails. Uh, but uh, the point that he was trying to make is even if your problem is not directly applicable for my reduce, see if you can reformulate it and use my previews for its solution. And here is his reasoning. He is saying that uh, there is a lot of uh, framework. I mean, uh, here is an example. There is a very nice framework which is called Giraffe, which is the framework for graph processing. Well, guess what? 90% of the graph processing can be done using my previews. And there is uh, very few edge cases that giraffe is actually catching. So if the point here is if you have a graph processing problem, see if you really hit these edge cases, in which case you might need something special. Or if you can use something generic enough and well understood enough so that you can take full advantage of flexibility and maturity of so, uh, this is kind of a collection of cases in which uh, you should at least attempt to see if you can use my previous to solve your problem. Uh, there is uh, also quite a few cases where you absolutely should not use my previous. And uh, the most prominent ones are recursive. Uh, execution like Fibonacci numbers. Although you can do some recursion using MapReduce, but generally the recursion problem typically don't fit well into MapReduce. And uh, the most uh, important thing today is uh, the real time calculation. So MapReduce is not suited for real time calculation. If you need something in real time, you should look at something. And then uh, there is uh, quite a few design guidelines when you design MapReduce. 
but uh, most of them are described well enough uh, in the book. I mean, the basic idea is uh, if you're trying to write your previous work, a job, you have to understand your data really well because uh, your data has to be organized in the way that it is applicable for the MapReduce execution. You also want to make sure that you are not creating too many mappers. You want to make sure that you are not creating too few mappers and this becomes an art. Uh, the same thing is Uh, going to those reducers because again, uh, if you start digging into how the things are executed, you will start understanding why too many mappers or too many reducers typically lead to the uh, player design. Uh, there is also another interesting uh, thing in uh, map reduce implementation, which is what well described in the book, uh, which people don't use enough which are counters, which uh, allow you to get a great insight into the execution of the work. But again, with, as with everything else, you have to use them traditionally and you have to know what to expose as counters, what to not. And again, you have to keep in mind that counters are global variables between all the mappers and producers. So if you have too many of them, too much time is spent on synchronization. Um, when uh, you are picking reducers, make sure that you are creating a lot of small files because if you have to change the jobs, it will be not very effective. And then you have to remember that uh, when you deal with HDFS, uh, although HDFS will allocate only the appropriate amount of memory on the disk for the small file, you are using a uh, memory space of the name node, which is uh, going to become your bottom there. Um, the other thing which is a normal uh, Java practice, uh, I mean, the majority of my previous jobs are written in Java, and one of the things when you're writing code in Java, try to avoid you if you can, because uh, stack operations are expensive. <coughs> Um, this is actually interesting because uh, we got burned by this several times. It was Mike's mistake. He was just learning to do. Which one is this now? <laughs> uh, this one. Uh, don't try to write it uh, directly to the user-defined files from the MapReduce jobs. Uh, there are two things. Hmm? That was a long time ago. Well, yeah, but I still remember. <laughs> it's all useful. No <laughs> I'm sure you have to plan to cover everything. Uh, so uh, there are two problems here. Uh, one problem is uh, when uh, you are trying to write to the same file on HDFS from the multiple processes, uh, you are um, each one is holding the log. So you are synchronized. You yeah. think that you're writing in parallel, but you're not. But MapR doesn't have that problem. I know, that's how we figure out this problem. Uh, so when we try to run the same code on MapR that doesn't have logs, uh, we've got a couple of files because every process was writing to the same place. Uh, the way, uh, so this is one part of the problem. The second part of the problem is uh, MapReduce has read drives. So uh, what is happening to your files during read drives is very, very unpredictable. It all depends on how you are writing the code. Uh, the way Hadoop solves this problem is actually quite elegant because uh, when you are writing data from Hadoop natively, uh, it, write, it creates a temporary directory for the current execution writes everything in the temporary directory and when the job is completed it merges everything together. Uh, HBase uh, is a, a great thing uh, for us. HBase always was a lot of hate relationships because uh, 
it's great for a lot of things. Uh, using it properly is a nightmare. And uh, there is a lot of interesting areas. This was also Mike's original problem that we caught. Uh, I tried to produce code that is reading and writing to each base. Uh, you guarantee to fail. The problem here is when you're writing to each base, it starts to split which means that your duration, uh, that your execution time starts to grow and uh, HBase scanner starts to time out on you. And uh, this is really bad practice. Um, yeah, this was the one that uh, got me several times. For everybody who used to work uh, with the application servers, uh, you are getting used to the class loader policy. So if you don't like the native implementation, you just overwrite it, and because application server default uh, class loader policy, your code first, everything works. Well, in Hadoop, they decided that your code comes last. So no matter how many times you try to overwrite it, it never picks it up. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on the uh, limitations of uh, you said, uh, you, I mean, of, of MapReduce, you mentioned that briefly. Can you make more examples of how it is not appropriate to use MapReduce for what type, types of data uh, sets? It's, we don't really it's a question. Can you repeat the question? <coughs> uh, yeah, uh, the question was... Uh, when not to use my MapReduce? Well, if you look at the problem and you are saying there is no way in hell my MapReduce will work for it. Are you asking? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm just repeating the question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, okay. in everything that we've seen, so, uh, couple of things. Uh, if your data set is too small, it's cheaper to do it in memory. Don't even bother. Uh, the second one is uh, you have um, real-time requirements. Uh, the problem is Hadoop is great. Uh, startup and shutdown takes time. Uh, shuffle and sort takes time. So if you have strict real-time requirements, don't even bother. Um, the third one becomes the interesting one. Um, if you read uh, Hadoop Bible, uh, it will tell you that uh, one of the main advantages of Hadoop is data locality. And uh, there is the whole generation of Hadoop developers uh, that are fairly convinced that data locality is absolute requirement for Hadoop jobs. In reality, it's not quite the case, because you have to consider uh, the, your execution time. Because uh, there is a whole class of MapReduce jobs, which are computational MapReduce jobs, uh, for which the execution time is measured in minutes, or maybe tens of minutes. In which case, uh, whether you load data in five milliseconds or 15 seconds is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, so this type of Hadoop jobs, if you read most of the documentation, it's not very applicable to Hadoop, but when you make the decision here, you have to consider the execution time. The other part is kind of similar. I mean, Here is uh, the real life example that we faced last week. Uh, we've been writing a map compiler. And uh, map compiler is in principle based. You read the tile of data, you convert it, and you write the result out. The problem is. Um, if you think about the roads, they never end at the boundaries. So instead of one tile, sometimes you need to bring more than one tile to make compilation successful. 
which kind of violates Hadoop principle because now you have the same tile that is read by multiple mappers. In reality, if it is a highly computational job, as it is for us, it's okay. It's, I mean, the point that I'm trying to make here, if you have embarrassingly a parallel problem, which is uh, computational in nature, you can uh, easily deal with the overhead of the data load, even if the data load is not local. And then uh, keep in mind the last thing, and this time I'm going crazy. <laughs> uh, Mike did an interesting experiment. Uh, we took a standard implementation of MapReduce because uh, we've been interested in the data in the data locality problem, and it turns out that uh, data locality in the normal Hadoop execution is myth was 30 percent what you're talking which uh, what, what I'm talking about is uh, if you try to use standard Hadoop input formats and run it on the data then we've observed when we were trying to see which data is local which data is not it's about 90 percent if you look at if you going back to Cloud so it's like 90 percent of the time it will be because there are three copies and as long as there but we also pushed it so that it wasn't. Uh, no, 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 no. The, 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 the problem is uh, the way job tracker works is uh, there are uh, several schedulers in Hadoop. And if you take uh, the standard fare scheduler, the way it works is uh, it has uh, jobs that are queued for execution. It gets uh, the heartbeat from the node saying, I'm available. And it says, sure, go. Although there are hints on locality, they are not implemented. If you try to use delayed fare scheduler, oh, yeah, yeah. then it goes up significantly. And there was a very interesting uh, white paper by Facebook guys how to actually consider it. Uh, so basically, with the exception of real time, the other class of jobs that we find that are absolutely not applicable for Hadoop is uh, the jobs where you can't split the execution. You have to have everything. But virtually every job which is partitionable is applicable for my producer. Yeah. Just, one, just one thing to add, if we start looking at Yarn, which is MapReduce 2, and we start looking at other stop, things... Stop, stop saying this phrase, I hate when people say What, this. Yarn? No, MapReduce 2. Okay, so if we look at Yarn, Yarn goes to containers, and with those containers, you're going to be looking for resources that, that match those containers, so you lose data locality. The upside, the flip side is that with network going to 10 gigi, Susar's not here to give me a hard time, you start getting faster and faster copying of the data. And as long as you're dealing with small chunks relative to your network bandwidth, data locality becomes less of an issue. Yeah, as long as he open this kind of worms, yard, <laughs> has nothing to do with my previous. Just, just don't be confused by the marketing. Right. So yard is resource management. On this resource management, you can run different applications. MapReduce is the same old MapReduce that we all know and love that is running on the different resource scale. So the MapReduce 2 is the worst possible name that they could come up with. Yeah? Uh, in your first example, Sorry. the face recognition, uh, do you need uh, to load uh, any special software or package or anything to process it? <coughs> of course. Of course. So MapReduce is not about miracles. It's about splitting jobs into chunks. What you do with your chunks is your business. So it gives you a rope. How you want to hang yourself is completely up to you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm totally new to this. The kind of you were talking about knowing the, finding the right balance of too many or too few mm -hmm. in your break. Is there any 
guidance on that or any equations that help you kind of identify what's optimal based on the size of your data or how you, you know, how, I don't, how complex the chunks are or something like that? I Alberto, should I put you on the spot? Because the answer will be whatever works. It, it, it really is an art and there is no recipe. You try different things and you're saying, oh crap. And then you're saying, oh, hey, it works. Could you identify like, the, the class of problem that you're solving? You know, like, uh, similar and kind of arrived at you know, something that is just sort of functionally representative of that type of data? Uh, it's more has to do with the type of calculations than with the type of data. Uh, really, because uh, if you have, I mean, let, let's try to do it this way. So um, there is a default split that is implemented by Hadoop, which is based on the block size. Uh, even with this, uh, it uses the block size, but you can control the block size. Uh, there is uh, very simple applications like, uh, I'm sorry, no disrespect, like high applications that <clears throat> don't do much with the data and it usually works fine. The moment you get into specific computational problems, you have to understand what you're doing. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the test. There will be nothing from yeah. it. And then kind of along the same lines, is, is there any way to sort of predict the processing time? You know, no, you just run it twice. Yeah. No, I mean, seriously. Oh. Um, see, there is another thing that I... Yeah, one second. There is another thing to keep in mind, which is important. Uh, when I... Uh, Titanic got a mail part. Uh, the phrase was the size matters, and I absolutely despise the phrase. When we start using Hadoop, I got it, the phrase, size matters. So the point here is, if you try to run something on small, I, take your mind out to the gutter. <laughs> I work with you, it's always in the gutter. I'm sorry. If you try to run something on the small data sample and you get good results, it doesn't mean anything. You have to run it on the full data sample because there can be a lot of things that you won't see on the small data samples. Uh, I'm sorry. That well, no, that's going to add to your, your answer. You actually can kind of calculate while you're running the job. If you go to the job tracker and you see the number of tasks that you have to run, and you go in and say how long the average it takes to, to complete each task, which is a part of it, and you know the number of tasks, you can say, okay, and we're running X number in parallel. That gives you a roughly idea it's gonna take two hours, two hours, 15 minutes, whatever. Uh, right. Uh, so you're essentially uh, reducing it to a simple, or a base calculation or function. In some cases. Times. In, in some parallel. cases, uh, yeah. again, uh, see this is uh, with the assumption that uh, it will always take you the same amount of time to do a calculation on the same amount of data, which is not right. That's, that's true. Well, true, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Kind of following the same question here. Have you seen a situation where, you, let's say, I wrote the wrong number, I would, so when they come to reduce, it's taking a long time to wait for one single. I'm looking with one. With the <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you. So, All right. Have you I mean, have you seen that situation come up, and what are we going to handle that situation? Uh, we've seen this situation a lot of times. Uh, so, here is, uh, there is a couple of things. First of all, uh, reducers are expensive. You have to realize this, and the more data you output from the mappers, the more expensive your reducers are. Uh, there is a couple of things that you can do um, in, um, let me see. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't put it here. Uh, there is the thing which is called compiler. 
So if you have a very long shuttle and sewer in some situation, confinement and fell in the air, in the pool would kind of try to give recommendations when to use and when not to use combiner because um, in general combiner helps uh, with a very situation when uses your combiner and make the process even longer. Uh, the other things that we've tried is if you don't really need shuffle and sort, don't do web videos, do my map. <coughs> uh, it turns out to be much better. But again, uh, it's very specific problem that planned and, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, problem. go ahead. Yes. The, there, are, there are some tricks you can do that are sort of in between the, the map only, and I need complete sort order one reducer, where perhaps there's some, you know, when you, when you, you can use multiple reducers and a partitioner to send the first set of data to the first partitioner, the second set, and when I say the first and second, I mean by the ordering of your key, so that Let's say you if you use four, the first partitioner would get the first quarter of the key space and so on. And then as long as you read the output, which is usually part zero zero zero, part zero zero one, part zero zero two, as long as you read those in order, the overall ordering is still preserved. But you split the work of the reducer. Now obviously that doesn't work if you're trying to come up with like an average for the whole set. It has to go through one. But if you're just kind of sifting through large amounts of data to create a slightly smaller set of data recombined in another way. You can do tricks like that. Uh, in, in principle, you can play a lot of interesting tricks with partition and also with the examples in the pool. Uh, we have uh, found uh, the problems with the standard uh, kind of partitioner, which we couldn't explain to ourselves at the beginning. And then uh, when we start looking at the key space, it became painfully obvious why these things are happening. But again, um, there is a lot of tricks that you can play, and unfortunately, there is no fixed recipe. You do this, and life is going to be great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you guys want to arm wrestle for this? Okay, I have a short question. Just curious, how do the uh, world do the uh, same data in? Uh, right. Uh, or is it as a result of previous methods? Yeah. Uh, uh, we've played a lot of different tricks uh, with the data that uh, we're dealing with. So uh, when uh, you read uh, any description of Hadoop, you would think that the only thing that you can do with the input format is to sequentially read portions of file, which has to do with the data locality, and this is part of the pitch that all the books will give you. In reality, let's take a completely different example. Let's say your data is organized by relatively small tiles, with uh, small files, which is not always a good thing, but sometimes it works, and every file contains a tile worth of data. In which case, you don't have to do split based on the data. You can do split based on the index. So if you know the list of tiles, you can split them between mappers and have every mapper explicitly read the tile that you need. Simple. I mean, again, you, you have to play with the data. You have to play with organization of the data. You have to play with the input formats. You have to try to think what is the most optimal split of the data. Uh, before, sorry, before you do the next question, a... I mean, I know we're going, could we get Kevin and Alexi to speak and then maybe do questions afterwards for everyone? Um, absolutely, that's for me. See, and that's why we keep you around. I know, I'm good for something. Uh, 
I'm sorry, uh, we will start with Alexis just due to the fact that uh, both his and my presentations are on my machine. And then we'll switch machines. It doesn't mean that Kevin's presentation is any worse, it's by far better. But both of us combined. Hey, Alexi. Alexi, when you talk, just stay at the podium. I don't want to have to chase you around like Boris. I'm trying to use microphone. Uh, use, use the, uh, use, uh, Boris, the other mic. The, the square mic. Just, just turn it on, yeah. I work for him. He found me. Was it the gutter, you know, adopted a lot of that? I, I didn't really try. Actually, it takes out the visual. It's just turn it on and just uh, bring the mic closer to your. See, I it took five years for me to understand it, but now I know. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Uzi, I kind of uh, want to cheat a little bit. So in book, first of all, uh, uh, why I decided to read, to write this thing. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, so it happened that I, uh, by, by kind of, uh, well, the life, so, have, so kind of go the way that I did a lot of things with Uzi when I was in after and uh, I realized that I have some kind of more or less interesting things to say, which uh, there's no book about Uzi, there is documentation, but there is uh, no kind of uh, discussion about how to use Uzi, what to do with this, what you can do with, with that. Uh, so I decided to write the book and Boris invited me to, to, to join the courses and my part of the Uzi. <laughs> so I don't repeat what I wrote about Uzi uh, in book. Uh, so I could say very little. So the three chapters, one chapter takes kind of definitions and discuss definitions, actions, and how Uzi workflow, uh, what the vista is it. The second uh, part uh, gives some example, uh, more or less uh, uh, real, time, uh, real life example where Uzi used to, to do more or less basic data analysis and um, to, to organize uh, uh, some machine learning procedures around data and uh, social data and uh, cell phones data and, and geographical data together. And then third time tells about some divisions of Uzi and how to overwrite them and how to, uh, to extend Uzi, things like this. Uh, by the way, one of the problems which Boris mentioned uh, that uh, you, it's hard to overwrite uh, uh, class in Hadoop, it's even worse than Uzi, so one of chapter one of fragment of this book is how to do this. Uh, and uh, the way, of course, to use uh, a little bit advanced Java to do class loader, uh, custom class loader, which would allow you to do such things. I think it works for Hadoop too. Um, anyway, uh, uh, then I moved to, uh, from Anoki to kind of real world, uh, what Horton works and been to the applied side. How oh, actually, should I press push up? Uh, page down. Page down. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, see, when I, as long as I was in Nokia, Uzi was kind of interesting thing for me, but I uh, saw that people actually don't use it much. In Nokia, at least, uh, my impression was that people are trying to play with it and use it, but, not, but it's kind of game. It's, it's not for real. You could always get around. Uh, and so it was kind of academical exercise for me to do this. When I got into the real world, I discovered actually a different picture. In this uh, companies like most insurance, com insurance company in the real world, which trying to play with big data, real client, they, uh, some of them, they put use it as a cornerstone of their uh, kind of approach to use big data. And I was really surprised to see it, but this is the fact, it's how people see it. They start from kind of designing workflow before they actually uh, 
uh, design tasks which will be inside this workflow. They start to organize the whole process before they have uh, pieces which will be inside it. <coughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's reality of life. I don't say that it's good or bad, but the fact is that in, in many of the places which I saw, not said so many, but other people in Fort Worth, they work for other consultants, so I see what's happening in for maybe hundreds of different companies, and uh, in 50 of them maybe Uzi is kind of how they start, how they can see the whole Hadoop ecosystem, ecosystem. <coughs> uh, through Uzi. Uh, and it kind of was a uh, real uh, eyes opening, I didn't, didn't realize that people are using this too much. Uzi, by the way, moved from incubator in Apache to full-size project very recently. Uh, now, uh, uh, the nature of clients which I worked with was mostly, uh, they were beginners. Nokia working clients with Hadoop for five years. And they don't, uh, I would say, as far as I imagine it, it's not critics don't take it this way, but they, it's, it's most research and development. They try to figure out cool things uh, and uh, new technology and new, new approach and new ways to play those data. And then uh, it goes somewhere to other departments. Uh, uh, these companies, which I deal with, they just want to build a regular procedure from the beginning to, to do something daily processing data and uh, getting some results and put it in production uh, from the beginning. It's kind of the primary purpose why they're trying to take Hadoop, not just to, to do something new, unusual, and to, to get kind of machine learning or, or relational things which it kind of create some new artifacts, but just to, to do their job, which it doesn't fit because data are fixed, so it doesn't fit to a normal kind of technology, relational database, so they move to Hadoop platform. So this is use cases, uh, it's very kind of general, very simple, very primitive, but this what people <coughs> on my, I just want to share it, they are doing kind, kind of, not in kind of scientific, or half scientific organization, which Nokia uh, is, in my opinion, <laughs> but in a kind of uh, industry. Uh, now, and that's a very kind of pretty, pretty strange thing, uh, uh, for instance, yeah, in Uzi, there are, as, as you probably know, um, there are synchronous and asynchronous actions. And uh, the, the company which developed Uzi, Yahoo and uh, Cloudera, <coughs> and to some extent for the works, but less less extent they uh, uh, don't pay much attention to uh, synchronous action or action which happening on the server where Uzi is running on this. Uh, process where Uzi server is running, which is web Uzi itself is, is a web application, so it's running inside <coughs> application server, web server, and uh, it has its own database, and some tasks running in this process. Uh, and this is kind of considered to be bad taste because uh, it, uh, first of all, is not parallel, it's kind of running in a very limited uh, set of resources, and second, it's um, uh, overload the server itself if you run some essential task in this uh, Uzi server because Uzi is supposed to orchestrate a lot of different processes and a lot of tasks in those processes, then it would slow down the whole kind of uh, orchestration uh, on cluster. <laughs> but uh, there are other considerations which uh, people in uh, this kind of industry take, they take more attention and, and they don't care about this kind of theoretical and right way to use Uzi, but they, put, they d develop a lot of synchronous actions like FTP, like uh, movement data files on HDFS, from HDFS, on HDFS, from place to place. Uh, uh, logging, for instance, which is a pretty big problem for <coughs> Hadoop altogether. But, so they try to, to do all this logging on high level on Uzi and desire simple instructions to do that. So this is kind of di direction of extensions, which uh, I actually s in several t t uh, times to try to, to introduce some code to, uh, to contribute code to Uzi which did the synchronous action and normally Cloudera and Yahoo <coughs> they didn't accept it because they kind of prefer uh, things like for instance uh, SSH <coughs> uh, action <coughs> which uh, works uh, on, on cluster but in, in this organization which I work with they said that no we don't want because of security reasons because of other reasons they don't want uh, unpredictable node actually to, to make connection to some production uh, subsystem and uh, start, start exchanging data through FTP for instance or write some, something from SSH so they want to write to write all this to concentrate all these actions in one node 
and to because you know that in security you not only uh, describe well who is doing what with password or with key, but also you very often specify that which server actually can connect to another server and do some job and ask some data. So they want to, to localize these uh, connections, and that's why they pay a lot of attention to synchronous action, which was a surprise to me, and it's not kind of right, but it's the reality of work. <laughs> now, um, with all this, I discovered recently Uzi 4, actually pretty different beast. <laughs> and uh, Uzi 4 introduced several new features, uh, or uh, features which were absolutely uh, unusable before that, but they became a kind of citizens in, in Uzi community now. So I selected three of those features, to, which are not described in this book, just to introduce them. And the uh, first feature is, is connect, connect, uh, Uzi, uh, Give, give you several ways to, 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 to expose what's happening inside Uzi, information about actions. There is REST interface which allows you to query Uzi at any moment and get information. There is Java interface which uh, works on the top of REST interface. And then there is login and there is Uzi console which gives you information about each action what's going on with this action. <coughs> but uh, it turns out that it's not good enough <coughs> because uh, 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 and, and Uzi designers, the developers in Yahoo, they recognize this fact. They added this JMS uh, uh, notification mechanism to Uzi, which allowed to expose this information uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the uh, technology, JMS technology, and so to, to send this, allow, force Uzi to send this information to the JMS server, outside server. Uh, what I'm talking about, uh, 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 let me tell. So Uzi from the beginning uh, has some internal database and has some support for uh, SLA, for instance. And it's, it, so, so in this database, Uzi writes information when some particular action start, when action finish. Uh, you specify that you want to have notifications if action takes too long or action start didn't happen when you expected or action didn't finish to some particular uh, moment. Uh, so uh, this information uh, was used in Yahoo, in some so-called Yahoo grid monitoring system, which is an internal system which wasn't, wasn't available for anybody. Uh, so anyone who wants to use this SLA mechanism from Uzi needed to write their own monitoring system which uh, uh, get into this database or use REST interface to eventually get to database and get this information and then interpret it your own way. This JMS notification mechanism allowed to, to, to do it uh, more straightforward and make it more available for applications. Uh, so, uh, you know, because I started talking uh, uh, about this, let me go to... So, uh, Uzi now, uh, the standard instruction well, manual how to install Uzi includes uh, how to configure and install JMS handler for each and inside each action, there are several parameters. I just listed it here. It's Uzi Service Extension, Uzi Service Event Handler Service, and Uzi GMS Producer, and some other which allow you to, in normal term of GMS and Java, to specify these handlers and topics and queues, and, and then this information just pushed to, to the server which you want to use for this purpose, and the server has the full picture of what's going on inside Uzi. Uh, another interesting uh, feature is uh, aggregating launches. This actually uh, feature existed in Uzi uh, from version 3, but nobody used it, and when I asked a couple of times Uzi architects in Cloudera and in Yahoo about this feature, they were very puzzled why somebody would try to use it. But in, now I kind of figure out why actually it's, it's here. In those examples, there are, so, uh, so launcher, if you read this book or just uh, believe on my word, uh, launcher is some mechanism in Uzi which runs in Uzi application server and which uh, prepare action, uh, any action, Java action, big action, hype action, scoop action, uh, dis distribute copy action, any action just to, to to prepare all necessary, implement all necessary steps to run it on Hadoop in distributed environment. 
Uh, so, uh, so you could rewrite this launcher now. Of course, you don't want completely uh, rewrite it because it will be too much work. But you could insert, you could use uh, this uh, rewrite mechanism to, to introduce cross-cutting cross -cutting concerns, like in the Blake Register, for instance, in typical case, you use um, obviously range of programming, like to, to, to provide login from any service, to provide transactional management, to provide security. So the same feature actually you can, uh, the, the same goal you could achieve with uh, this uh, launchers. Uh, in, in this example on my slide, I talk about pig launcher. <laughs> pig launcher has this class named pig main and with prefix of package. And uh, so what you can do, you could override uh, all the examples can contain this uh, class which extends big main and, and which uh, provides some kind of extra functionality. So what you can do with this? I would say that you could provide login definitely. You could provide, well, you could con 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 connect to external services to get parameters like database or REST service which run outside of your world and to get this information, to provide this information for your big script or Java or whatever action <coughs> which will be running. So it will allow to, to kind of to open a little bit Hadoop platform and then provide you a place where you could insert your own code which will <coughs> communicate to external systems. And maybe there are other ways how you could use it, but this is, uh, on my opinion, appropriate way to do it. And the last feature which I want to talk today about is uh, testing. So Uzi, Uzi was always pretty hard to, to test with workflow. Uh, if workflow has more or less complicated logic, uh, at some point when I worked for this company, I even introduced some random testing. Some, uh, and in, in file this inversion disclosure about random testing. So which uh, implemented this way that uh, each action has some probability that it will fail, and then I could run this uh, whole, whole workflow or coordinator and deal with this failure and see actually how my uh, recovery mechanism deal with this all kind of failure. Uh, so, uh, but uh, now yeah, there's my much better and straightforward way to do it. You could run your workflow or coordinator just from Eclipse. It runs on, it, it doesn't run this, this straightforward on uh, Windows because Windows doesn't support big, but on Unix or, or on Macintosh, you could completely run from Eclipse or from IntelliJ this uh, part of Uzi, which uh, called Mini Uzi, which allow you to, to test complete workflow without cluster, without uh, Uzi server running, just, just as a normal Java application. And this is, I believe, pretty useful feature if work, workflow is complicated and if workflow uh, con uh, contains some more or less sophisticated logic. By the way, in my last project uh, with a uh, company in Cleveland, insurance company, they, the workflow was, uh, well, maybe more than a thousand lines. It contains several sub-workflows. That's how they see and design their own system on Hadoop. Uh, so the, and the workflow was really complicated and to observe it without, and, and you know that there's no public editor, <coughs> available editor even to, to, to do this workflow. You could do it in, just an XML file in some kind of text editor. Uh, <coughs> so there is no visualization for, for workflow. And with all this, uh, testing the map compiler. Workflow is it's kind of way. And this uh, menus allow you to, to override to, 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 to override this hardware and to, to test a workflow. It's, it's very easy. I have actually a piece of code, but <coughs> we decided to watch that I don't show this piece of code. But basically, what happened, you you, you create, there is a class in Uzi called Uzi Client, and you uh, create this Uzi Client and load uh, from file workflow into this Uzi Client and then write into uh, your file system, Unix file system, for into this workflow and uh, all jars and all these things, do it in this completely prepared this environment and then run it. And it kind of runs and, then, and most of the errors which are in this workflow, you put this way discover and, uh, and you don't need cluster, you don't need pretty expensive procedure of deploying this new cluster and figure out what happened, what, what happened in the cluster. So that's conclude what I want to tell you about using today.
because we are pretty late, let's, let's keep our questions for that. Let's hold questions after Kevin. Then. Right around now, you start to lose people as the last express train goes out to Naperville. All right, so I'll, I'll be very quick. So I'm going to very briefly talk about uh, Big Data and Hadoop Security. Um, there are two chapters in the book uh, on the subject. One about securing Hadoop itself and the other about complementing Hadoop security mechanisms with other things in order to achieve uh, your organization's security requirements. First of all, why should we even care? Um, I, I know uh, many customers are not as concerned about securing data sets um, while you're running um, Hadoop. Um, and some are not even concerned with securing the, and releasing data sets. Well, um, is, data, is the data's growth has been um, pretty explosive IT environments have been pretty complex, and so a lot of organizations are struggling to understand the impact of what's in their data and the impact of the release of their data. Specifically, uh, a lot of customers in the healthcare space, um, in the financial space, and in the government space are having to face um, regulations related to you know, privacy information within their data. Um, and trying to scrub that information. Um, and if they don't meet them, they have to face pretty big fines. Um, some organizations even get to the point where um, the data scientists who are analyzing the data, who are running the jobs, um, can't see all of the data. So they have requirements so that you have to um, really filter the data uh, based on their query uh, based on their need to know and their authorization credentials and things like that. Um, and of course we know the mismanagement of data sets is pretty costly. So I'm going to give a couple examples. Uh, the first one you may have heard of, um, it was in 2006, it was at AOL Research. And uh, yeah, CNN Money uh, labels this, I forget what number it was, but one of the dumbest moments in business. Uh, AOL Research decided, hey, let's anonymize our search, uh, our user searches, um, and put them on the web for research purposes. And what we'll do is we'll scrub, we'll scrub those searches um, of usernames so nobody can you know, tell who they are. They thought that was kind of neat. I'm not really sure exactly the reason why they were releasing it. It wasn't on the web very long. Um, however, it led to a lot of problems. Um, here's a great example. Um, how many of you go to the internet and do a search on restaurants close by? Like if you want to, if you want to know like how it's been reviewed and stuff. So, so quite a few of you. Um, how many of you have Googled yourself? <laughs> Turns out a lot of those people did too. <laughs> so you could, even though they were anonymized, even though the usernames were gone, you see a lot of data of people like searching local restaurants, which when you do that, it gives people an idea of the region where you live. Um, and if you Google a chef a lot, you, you know, and you're looking at search results, you're thinking, well, either that person really wants more information about that person who lives in the same area that they live in, or maybe it's them. And so it didn't take long, a reporter uh, was able to use a phone book in the search results and you know identified someone put it on the front page of the paper end of the day 
Uh, AOL got off pretty easy. $5 million plus $100 per user who was a user at AOL during those three months, plus $50 to any user who just felt like they felt offended by it. So I don't know what the actual number was, but it was big. The CTO resigned, um, people were fired at AOL. And that was, you know, that was in 2006. Uh, that was pretty negligent, but the next one is actually not as obvious. Um, it, have you heard of the Netflix contest fiasco? This is, this is a really good one. Um, Netflix, um, how many of you use Netflix online? So they have a recommended for you feature. Of, uh, based on your previous viewing and based on the way that you've ranked other movies, we think that these movies will be great for you. Um, and so they decided to have a million dollar contest. Whoever can improve our algorithm by 10% will get a million dollars. And what they did is they said, well, we're gonna release this training set of anonymized uh, 500,000 of our users, anonymized viewing records and the way they, they ranked uh, movies. And you can use this as you're trying to build your algorithm. So these two guys from Texas said, I wonder what would happen if we take those anonymized records and compare it to IMDB, the Internet Movie Database. Well, it turns out that a lot of people who rate movies on Netflix also rate them on IMDB. And it turns out a lot of the people on this data set did it at the same time. So they published a paper, and most people said, well, what's the big deal? Movies. You know, it's just people, you know, what movies they liked, right? It also turned out that, you know, people who felt comfortable about publicly making movies on IMDb, but there are some movies that they watched on Netflix that they weren't really comfortable with people seeing. And so this revealed a data about their sexuality, their religion, and their politics. Um, end of the day. $9 million settlement. Um, big time, big time changes. And there's more. Um, a lot of those deal with the area of research called differential privacy. That is when you have one data set that you think is harmless, but when you combine it with another set, you may reveal more information than you intended to, to release with your data set. And the result is pretty challenging um, and pretty costly for a lot of companies. Um, obviously, cybersecurity attacks are on the rise, both externally but also internally. Um, some of the news recently, a, a, a contractor for the US government, I think if you were to ask the government today, should he have had access to all that information internally, they would say, no, probably, probably not. We probably should have restricted even to our internal <coughs> users the amount of data so how does this uh, relate to Hadoop? Well, Hadoop was developed without security in mind at all. It was all focused on, uh, the assumption was public data, um, and the assumption was trusted machines working in a trusted environment. Um, and so there was no security model. Um, there was no authentication of users or services. Um, anyone could submit arbitrary code and it would just be executed. Somebody could create their own task tracker. Um, somebody could replace another Hadoop service if they wanted to. Um, later authorization was added, but because you know people could impersonate other users, authorization didn't really do much. So Yahoo came in, um, and in 2009, they uh, focused on trying to retrofit security into Hadoop. And so they focused on authentication, which was really the big gap area because um, they, you know, in order to do security, you have to identify the users, the, the processes, and um, the processes needed to authenticate themselves to each other so that there were no rogue processes written by somebody else, right? Uh, the challenge is, um, yes, there's authentication. Um, yes, there's elements of authorization. Um, you can do network-based encryption for people who are worried about that, uh, but it's very complex. 
um, as, as you'll see in this book. It's, it's a pretty complex model and, and very, this is what happens when you retrofit security um, in something that wasn't really designed for security. Um, the security configuration is pretty complex and it's easy to mess up. You could do things like um, say yes for you know, for all of my um, you know, network traffic, I would, like it, I would like it to be encrypted. But if you don't set a couple of flags, all of your cryptography keys will be exchanged in the clear. So someone snooping on your network would be able to see the encrypted tra traffic, but they would have the key so they could decrypt it. Like little things like that, um, you could really mess up. But things are changing. So if you have customers or if your organization is worried about these types of things, it's really important to understand how it's configured and, and you have to understand your security requirements very well um, because it's, it's very easy to, to leave something out. Um, and so I mentioned retrofitting security later makes things complex. It's a pretty complex uh, security data flow. Um, Kerberos RPC um, is used um, via SASL GSS API between um, services and each other and between users processes and the services. Um, for web consoles it uses Kerberos Spinego authentication. Uh, originally it was pluggable HTTP authentication but I think over time they said well we should probably be a little bit more consistent and, and, and use Kerberos across the board. But as you see, there's there's um, a little bit more um, with RPC.digest and some block access request stuff. Um, and I realize this is an eye chart, and I know it's getting late, so I'll, I'll skip over a lot of it, but as you'll see from the slides, um, distributed security is pretty hard because um, not only does the user process need to, to be authenticated to the services and the services to each other, but based on a user's client or processes, uh, these, these services are doing work on behalf of that user. And so as a result, there's tokens being used. So after um, the Kerberos authentication, uh, the name node, for example, creates a delegation token. Um, that is then passed on to the job tracker from the process that then uh, creates a job token that's used by the tasks. Um, and so that, you know, uh, task, you know tasks and, and services and processes can't um, go to a data node and say, hey, give me, give me a block of data or, or write this block of data. Um, there are block access tokens used. So it gets, it's super complex. Each one of these have, has to be configured a little bit separately. Um, and as a result, um, you can secure Hadoop in, in this way um, to make sure that all the processes and sub-processes communicate with each other securely and identify them, the, each other um, in a secure way. But it is complex. As a result, there's a lot of vendor activity um, with Hadoop security. Um, and here are just some of the products that are, are being released. Probably most notably in the last year, Intel decided that they wanted to do a secure Hadoop distribution because a lot of their customers uh, needed it. Um, specifically, a lot of their customers wanted encrypted data on disk. And so they came up with a distributed cryptography um, algorithm. Um, and they were able to do it fast with their processors. So their implementation takes advantage of their own processors so that you can have encrypted HDFS data. Um, they also made some other changes. Um, and they contributed all of that to Apache. And it's slowly being worked through in, in something called Project Rhino. And I won't go, go through all of them. I will say that a lot of my work um, <coughs> lately has revolved around Apache Accumulo. Because Accumulo is uh, 
a, you know, based on Google's big table, but allows you to do cell-based security. So um, each cell has a visibility attribute that you can constrain uh, based on roles or attributes of users, which means um, a lot of my customers are using Accumulo as the, the security mechanism over Hadoop. Um, the challenge with that is you have to kind of fit all the security to fit this Accumulo data model. Um, and so you have to, um, with, with every piece of data, figure out what attributes or, or what roles are associated with this particular cell. And that can be tricky. Uh, the other tricky thing is, with the Cumulo, um, it uses its own kind of storage mechanism for both the users and um, the way that um, users authenticate and get their authorization credentials. However, um, it's it's fairly easy to extend um, some classes, and you could write your own, which is which is what I've been doing, so that um, you can use someone else's identity and identity management infrastructure and pull those credentials from a directory server, an attribute service, etc. So um, I mentioned the Intel distribution. Project Rhino um, is this open source effort kind of launched by Intel but also joined together with a lot of other folks and what they did is um, they contributed their code um, into Apache and, and it's you know, they're, they're slowly going through it. Um, the things that you'll see um, that may be changing are encrypted data at rest. Again, this is, this is the work that Intel did to use their own processors to do the distributed cryptography stuff. Um, but it's very promising in, in the fact that, you know, Apache is working through this because so many people have, have this requirement. Um, the slide has more, the book has a little bit more. Um, they want to use, instead of a Kerberos-based authentication and authorization framework, a more generic authentication and authorization framework. So for example, if you wanted to, um, to use something as uh, robust as Exacomal, um, the extensible uh, access control markup language, for example, for uh, providing some access control and, and things like that if you wanted to use SAML, if you wanted to use other mechanisms other than Kerberos, you could plug it in. Who's, who's to say when that will be implemented, but I think it'll be, it'll be really good and hopefully the security will be um, maybe a little bit uh, simpler to, to implement. Um, the last thing is it focuses on improved security in HBase. So there's, a, there's certainly a level of security in HBase now, but not to the level that um, Accumulo has, the cell-based security. Um, uh, right now, you know, because of my customer set, uh, Accumulo is, is kind of their go-to thing for security. But HBase, I think, um, overall has a much wider user base. Um, and I know that um, there's, there's a lot of momentum about it. Right behind each base. So. so I said I'd do it quick, so that was pretty quick. Um, so, really, the best guidance I think for us now is number one, understand the, uh, try to identify and understand the sensitivity levels of our data, right? We have to understand if there are access control policies associated with the data and understand the impact of the release of the data, kind of like the Netflix and the AOL. Another area of, of research that, um, that is focusing on this right now is the differential privacy aspect. Uh, Cynthia Dwork from Microsoft is kind of, kind of in academia leading this effort of trying to figure out how to successfully anonymize data sets um, in a way that it doesn't reveal more information than you intended to. Um, policies and procedures related to data ingest, access control within your organization, cleansing, sanitization, destruction, um, 
auditing, monitoring procedures, and incident response. All of these things have to really be um, carefully constructed um, if you have a very highly secure uh, customer set. Um, and finally, I say at this point, if your security requirements are are that um, are that serious, then you need to complement Hadoop security with something else. Um, Hadoop out of the box won't do encrypted HDFS, for example. Um, so while we're all waiting for Project Rhino, uh, that's what we have to do. And so um, the good news is for uh, for all these other vendors. This is this is their market. Um, so there are solutions that you can that you can use to couple your you know, Hadoop solutions with. Yeah. When you talk about <clears throat> encryption to the disk mm -hmm. or at at rest, mm -hmm. is it really a big issue? Because since you're writing in HDFS, you're writing to a block. The block sits on top of the file, your Linux file system. Linux file system itself could have the encryption, so that the encryption can be done at the lower level. So yeah, that's that that is a potential solution that you could use. But that only solves that that at rest issue. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I always looked at like Protegrity and it's like you, you start looking yeah, at Yeah, so it. Hadoop itself won't do it. But that's right. that's a way to do it. Now you can see the Jira task that they're working on right now is they have a I mean a key distribution and management algorithm for supporting crypto in MapReduce. That's <coughs> That's a pretty challenging task, but we'll see how that works and how fast it is. Well, have you ever taken a codec and, like, in other words, doing the, the uh, compression codec replaced with an encryption codec? No, no. Okay. <laughs> but but that's just a variation of the example he gave, which is you may have encrypted it on disk, but you, if the keys are flying around, I mean, if you're using stock to do on top of an encrypted file system, you can still get the data through the sure unless the yeah, unless you set up right. um, you can unless you set up the you know the encryption on the on the wire flags and it's it's really easy to just forget about that uh, which is where people run into trouble yeah so I have a question so um, you know a lot of be, you know because like most things that are Java projects security is always you know an afterthought. And so, like Hadoop, you say, well, you know, setting up a secure Hadoop environment looks really hard. We're just going to play with it to start, right? And then pretty soon, more and more people come, and then you start getting into the, uh-oh, we, we need some walls so that these people can't see these people's data because, you know. And so now you're in a situation where you have an open Hadoop environment. It's kind of a bring your data. We're all going to do mashups of this data with that data, and I'll get all this great customer insight. But then when you bring the security hammer down, you kind of go from everything open to everything's locked down. And it's kind of like when you flip on you know, IP tables or something, you go everything's allowed by default, everything's denied by default. And everybody freaks out because now nobody can get the job done. How do you kind of ramp up security, I guess in Hadoop, where you've already sort of got an established like free for all. I mean, is it is it impossible, or is it just everybody just has to suck it up and deal with the transition? It, yeah, it's well, it's really hard to do that when people are used to one thing, and then all of a sudden you have to switch to something else. Um, I, you know, I have seen situations where it was all open, and then it went to closed, and then you use network isolation as as the mechanism, and then you know. There's actual physical security based on the people going in and things like that. Um, but wow, for for most of these, um, if you don't set it up ahead of time, it's a it's a real big challenge. Well, one, one thought I have. I know that's not a. I mean, maybe you set up like the secure cluster and you start moving pieces in, and then when the data you want moves into the security space, then maybe. You hop on, you know, you do what you have to do to kind of sure. play in the... I've also seen, you know, separate clusters based on the data sets. Okay. But and see, the, the whole premise of Hadoop was you, everybody stored their data there, and then the one, 
through this and you get interesting results. Exactly. The moment you start creating silos, I mean, yeah, so security kind of defeats the, the overall purpose of trying to connect the dots with your information yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Right. Uh, on your list of uh, vendors doing things right now, uh, seems like the majority of them are still looking at the, uh, yeah, look, at, look at this list here. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm looking at this whole list here because very much of them are still looking at data encrypting the process of getting into the system, you know, after rules and so on. Uh, all the other ways to encrypt the information of the, the, the data on the disk, that's basically it, yeah, right? So, but that doesn't stop the answer, because like most of the discussions right here is when you put two data sets together, you come with answers that uh, are still in fact, or you shouldn't be getting. You not, should not be getting instead of you know, allowing it. So, other than the couple of items in there, you know, like the, uh, in my opinion, you have got one kind of like a mask and some of that information. Uh, are there other efforts in that area to, 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 to mask that information? And even that, I don't know how that does that. It, it seems like academia is focusing on that more than some of the products are. But yeah, the, the IBM Ipsos Ipso Beer, I haven't, I haven't looked at how well that does it, but yeah, they, they focus on obfuscation. Um, the, uh, the knowledge discovery and data mining community has been focused on this issue for, I guess, 20 years. You know, so for, for a very long time, they've come up with some techniques. I don't know if they've actually gotten into the product space. Uh, talking about fuzzing the data and, you know, and, you know, a lot of the work in the statistical databases. So I think eventually we'll see some of that work that was done 20 and 10 years ago start to, to come into the products. Is there any more work on that sort of architecture? I saw you had that one slide on <clears throat> setting up like uh, visibility fields. Um, it seems like if you're trying to architect data that it's going to at least be allowed in environments where it's more secure, there's usually three area or three things, bad influences that break security. It's like engineering, sales, and marketing. You know, someone comes up and says, hey, we want to use this, put this smash up over here. How do you prepare for that, or can you prepare? Uh, in the you know the the trick about you know the slide here is that um, in order for that model to work, everything has to fit into that model, right? And um, so you have to number one understand your access control policies, and then kind of fit them into ABAC attribute based access control, and figure out as you're putting data in, you know, your example, okay, this is okay for marketing. This is not okay for marketing, you know, things like that. Um, but that's that's probably the biggest challenge um, because for customers with you know the requirements that, that demand that um, you do kind of have to fit it all in that in that size hole, um, which means a lot of data preparation and the way that you're ingesting you know data into this kind of framework um, is a little different. Once it's there, though, um, it works. But you know what? People are human too, and we're we're in a fallen world, and, and people mislabel stuff. And so this is still, you know, a technical way to 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 do security, but it's not perfect. Yes. So that credentials data store <coughs> in this example, um, where that needs to probably go on every node, right? Shared nothing architecture you want to have, or 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 you have to reach out to some separate. Yeah. So um, the way I set it up is, I, you know, the the code that you see there is I'm reaching out to um, an authentication authorization system that already exists. <coughs> so instead of relying on Accumulo itself, uh, sometimes it's more helpful to, especially most organizations have their own identity and access management, right? Um, so I, I found that's a lot of help. I think that's helpful because otherwise you have to port an organization's identity and access management in, into a QMO. Probably not the most efficient use of resources. So, so that's why I did this. Um, I, 
think uh, the, the company Squirrel really focuses on this a lot too. So. You end up having two uh, sources of truth if you have it outside of Cumulo and inside of Cumulo. So which one is more right? Oh, well, um, <coughs> you, you write your own client, right? Right, well, that's, you, you so, get rid of that. And so, I, you know, when you do this, um, just make sure that there's, there's not a Kevin in a Cumulo and a Kevin outside of Cumulo. Just use one, right? Right. Good point. Um, yes? How did Yarn help or at least try to bring a little more predictability into the complexity? Or, or did it just kind of firm in some stuff that was baked originally to be off by Yahoo and clean it, but it's still complex? Um, to security? Yeah. I, I, I really don't think it's a factor. I think, I think the issue still exists. Yarn, yarn, not yarn. So, but did they did they extend the model and at least bake some things in cleaner from the resource schedule? Uh, well, I think I think the way they, they focused on yarn, I think it was smart because they um, they really you know split up some some jobs that a job tracker was doing, for example, um, and made things more extensible and probably more flexible and um, better performing, but. But yeah, as, as far as security goes, there's still still the same issues. I don't know. Did did you uh, want to address that as well? <coughs> but I had another <coughs> question. So, no, normal Hadoop ecosystem is kind of a combination of well, Java produced jobs, and uh, you could use Accumul or HBase as a storage format. And, but then there is PIP, there is Hive, there are HDFS <coughs> files. So, uh, and you will normally have some freedom to, to combine those jobs and to use different technologies to process data. So, accumulate model looks so only good to accumulate, but nothing else. So, either you should forget about other pieces of Hadoop system, or sure, uh, I, 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 it, it looks to me like it has no sense at all. I'm sorry. Sure, I mean, uh, the, the folks who use Accumulo, um Typically, you know, they're they're kind of stuck in that model because everything is kind of stored not, in that, not way. that model. But you should cut off uh, all other components of Hadoop, Hadoop ecosystem and forget oh, about. Oh yeah, it's it's kind of like you're just focusing on accumulator. That's it, <laughs> correct? But that's that's really the only choice you have at this at this point. Um, the way that the model is. <coughs> Are there any security efforts, basically, just to have like a library of workflow? Uh, it's it's kind of pre-approved maps or something to act on arbitrary data. Hmm. Um, I, I haven't really, I haven't heard of any. So. Not that we're trying to cut you off. Oh yeah, but well, yeah, I know that you're because we are starting to lose people. Um, Dean, come on up here because we have to. We got two books that we have to get rid of. Yeah, I'm not getting the whole. Yeah, yeah they're kind of heavy. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Put them back. <laughs> okay, so as fellow judge, right. who do you think? Uh, I was well. A couple of people left that I thought asked really good questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, must available. be present oh. to win. That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's um, why you're still here, Steve. I thought when she got at the lady that expressed that she was a beginner, I thought this might be a good thing to get you started. So, that's plus you had a good, you do have a good question yeah, about trying question, to calculate so. job, how long the job runs. Yeah, in my, I work in the email marketing industry, and half the stuff we do, I, we don't work in like data that's as big as like Facebook and lists and LinkedIn and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but it's still the, the biggest problem we have is transferring data, and of course the clients like, you know, why does it take you? Do you, who do you think the other one should be? Uh, I don't know. Once you pick one. Oh God, it's kind of hard. Um, everyone, some people I had picked had already left, so that hard really hurts. Um, well, I'll tell you, my other choice was going to be the guy with the plaid shirt here because right, he asked Igor. the shortest question and had the longest answer, and that was the first one. <laughs> right, that was Igor. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, tough one. Everyone. 
I'm at a loss. Forrest, who do you think asked some of the good questions? I'm all of this. I, I think Steve has some good questions, but I don't know. I have another question. <laughs> this is called Lost Chug. Chug. This is called Chug, and where's the beer? That might be the best question. That is a very good question. That is a great question. <laughs> no, the answer, the answer to that, um, unfortunately, uh, HR uh, has gotten in the way of all of this for us. Because um, we, we do like to, we, we used to be able to, HR, when it was NAVTEC HR, they wouldn't let us get away with it because they had uh, the, the JavaScript user group come in here and marketing and all that. Damn Europeans. I got power. We're not allowed to drink. <laughs> yeah. No, but we, um, if, if you come to the Monday uh, lunches, you can drink. It's at Jefferson Tap. And if we ever host a meeting at Jefferson Tap, obviously alcohol is there. But it's BYOB. No, I didn't buy that. Huh? Not around you, because I actually do drink. <laughs> All right, too much information. But, but again, we're not trying to kill you off. You guys have, you guys have more questions? You know, feel free to come on up. I don't know if I'm a subject of matter. Like most, like most things, you know, you don't do it. So, um, yeah, no, we.